This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Rachel Neuer, author of I Feel Love, MDMA and the Quest for Connection in a Fractured World. It's a history of the drug known as Molly and Ecstasy that's about to be approved by the FDA as an aid in fighting PTSD. Rachel Neuer, thanks for talking to Reese. Thanks so much for having me. Um, why did you write I Feel Love? Great question. There's really two answers to that. Uh, the first is the sort of common good answer, which is there wasn't a book about MDMA. It's this uh, huge cultural phenomenon. We're probably going to see it, well, hopefully see it approved by the FDA for PTSD treatment within the next year. Yet there wasn't a resource that brought all the information about this complex, nuanced drug together in one place. Just felt like people needed to have that touchstone. And you know, there's just so many misconceptions about MDMA that I wanted to dispel those, not just for readers, but also for myself. Mm-hmm. The other part of that answer is a more personal one. It was the height of the pandemic. Um, like many people, I was kind of having a crisis, you know, what am I doing with my life? Am I going in the right direction? And for me, that was really manifesting in worries over my career. I had spent about a decade reporting about illegal wildlife trade, which is not a cheery topic. <laughs> We're talking like, you know, slaughtered rhinos and elephants, and there just weren't many hopeful stories there. And I was, I really realized that I was looking for a change of pace for a new intellectual and personal challenge. And MDMA turned out to be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and that helps explain the subtitle of the book, right? Yes. Which is? <laughs> MDMA and the quest for connection in a fractured world. Yeah. Yes. So this is, uh, this is like your pandemic baby. This is, yeah, this is exactly that. It's kept me very occupied in the pandemic. And um, you know, my last book, I went to like 12 countries to report it. But this one I could very easily do from the phone and just right here in the good old US of A and yeah. um, a quick hop over the pond to the UK. There was certainly that, uh, you know, I think weirdly, if we we talk about the psychedelic renaissance at Reason and obviously other people do, but the, that might be one thing the pandemic really helped because you couldn't travel out. Yep. So travel in, right? You exactly. Know? Yeah. And I, I say this in the beginning of the book, so it's not a surprise, but the idea for the book came to me while I was on MDMA, <laughs> but not at a club, which is my preferred environment yeah. for this, sitting on my couch at home at like, you know, 7 p.m. on a Friday night. Um, just uh, before we get into the uh, conversation about the history of MDMA, I'm, I'm struck by your saying, you know, this came to me while I was on MDMA. As, as a broad cultural background, how old are you? I am, let's see, what am I now? 38. It okay. keeps changing. Yes, it does <laughs> on an almost annual basis, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but one thing, like, have you always felt comfortable saying, hey, you know what, I use drugs that are technically or you know, openly mm-hmm. illegal. Um, and have you always felt comfortable doing that? Or is there a shift going on in our society where people are starting to say, you know what, like these drugs are not sanctioned or they're kind of sketchy or people kind of look at you weird, but let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, I was definitely not always the person who's like, I use drugs. I like yeah. drugs. Um, I was a dare kid from the mm-hmm. 80s. I grew up just- Another Great success yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah, I, I completely swallowed that mes- message. I internalized mm-hmm. it. Um, if I heard of friends doing drugs, you know, whether it's weed or ecstasy, I looked down on them. I judged them. I thought, you know, people who do drugs are looking for an escape or their burnouts or, you know, they're going to frazzle their brain. It wasn't for me. Um, that began to change in college. I had a friend who introduced me to mushrooms, but I didn't really know anything about them. It didn't have the stigma attached to it like ecstasy did. So I was like, sure, I'll try a new thing. I love new experiences. Um, And that was great. Really enjoyed it. But it didn't open my eyes to MDMA at all. I still had this negative connotation. Is it because MDMA, I I suspect in D.A.R.E., when mm-hmm. you were in grammar school, they weren't yeah. talking about mushrooms so much. But is it yeah. is it also because MDMA is engineered? MDMA is a pharmaceutical of some sort. It's a pill. It's not a naturally occurring thing. I think for a lot of people, that is absolutely the case. Um, for me, I had a personal negative connotation. So when I was my freshman year of college, a friend's brother committed suicide. Mm-hmm. 
And um, this is in my town of Mississippi, and everyone blamed his use of ecstasy. They specifically said, you know, Chris, he was taking all this ecstasy, you know, it made him so depressed and he killed himself. So instead of looking at the underlying drivers of what led him to make that decision, everyone just pointed at the drug. And I, you know, my dare kid self said, yeah. okay, yeah, it must be this awful ecstasy thing. I'm never going to touch that. Right. Um, let's talk about the uh, kind of discovery or rediscovery of MDMA in what, late 60s, early 70s. Lay out the, the history of MDMA. And for the people out there, you might know it as Molly or ecstasy or Adam. I mean, but, you know, what is MDMA and where did it come yeah. from? Yeah, that's a that's a great Disclaimer for everyone out there, Molly and ecstasy are the same thing, and they refer to what is supposed to be MDMA. Whether your street bought Molly or ecstasy is MDMA is another question, but yeah. they refer to the same thing. It's just a branding tactic. Um, so the history part of the book, surprisingly, was actually my, one of my favorite parts to write. My mom's a historian, but I'm not a history person myself, and I just really got into it because there were so many unexpected twists and turns. So. Um, first of all, MDMA is a lot older than most people think. It was first synthesized, well, it was first patented, let's say, on Christmas Eve 1912 by the German pharmaceutical company Merck, uh, you know, respected play, uh, group. Um, and they weren't looking for something to change people's brains. They were looking for a blood clotting agent. And MDMA was just a chemical intermediary on the steps they needed to get there. Whether or not Merck... Either that or they had a chemist who just liked the way it felt. It. And was like, yeah, 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 yeah. it's, yeah, it's blood, for blood. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, very sadly, the uh, that chemist was killed a few years later in World War I. So um, anyway, so Merck, whether or not anyone there actually tried it, we don't know. They've been really cagey about letting people into their archives. Um, it seems like maybe they did. There's little hints here and there of chemists being like, hey, this is pretty interesting. Let's yeah. uh, take a closer look. Um, fast forward to the 1950s, MDMA pops up in the U.S. for the first time. Uh, this is during the U.S. government's search for chemical truth serum. So let's figure out how we can control the minds of our enemies by um, conducting experiments on U.S. citizens to see how this goes. Right. So this is... Uh, part of uh, MK Ultra, and it's the it was, epiphenomenon that's of that. What, it wasn't. Yeah. It MK wasn't Ultra MK itself, Ultra, but, but yeah, it was the yeah. Army's version of the CIA's yeah. trials. Um, right. uh, again, we don't have the sort of smoking gun evidence that MDMA was ever given to anyone under this um, this experiment. But there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Um, people who have had more time than I have to pursue the. Mm -hmm. Um, Freedom of Information Act process uh, have gotten really close to revealing that indeed the U.S. Army did do this. Um, a, a, a student named Nicholas Denome, I think he's gotten his PhD now, so Dr. Nicholas Denome, um, tracked down a document that pointed to Tulane University in New Orleans um, as having contracted with the Army and MDMA was on their list of drugs. But when uh, Nick asked for the specific document from the U.S. government that would uh, show whether or not it was actually given to anyone, they said, oh, we lost it. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. And there was that weird moment when Richard Nixon, after visiting Tulane, gave a speech where he said, I don't know, I really love you all. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I was that like, would be like, that I didn't know be, what yeah. this, I should have put it in my book. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> yeah, in another <laughs> reality. So that takes us through the 50s. Then. Yes. Um, so MDMA pops up again in police records of seizures in around 1970, 1971, um, which probably just points to the fact that the Controlled Substances Act had just come out and had criminalized MDA, right. which is closely related molecule. And um, entrepreneurial chemists are probably just looking for a way to get around the law mm -hmm. by sticking an extra methyl group on, poof, MDMA. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, the police even thought that they were seizing MDA, but we don't know anything about those chemists. We don't know who their customers were. We don't know who was using it for what. Uh, what we do know is that MDMA comes up again in 1975 when a uh, PhD student at Berkeley named Carl Reznikoff uh, got with his mentor there, a guy named Alexander Shulgin. Mm -hmm. Everyone calls him Sasha, yeah. a uh, famous psychedelic chemist, and they were working on a summer project together. and. Um, Carl He's, was, uh, Shulgin is kind of the Thomas Edison of psychedelics, right? Like he <laughs> that's just a great way of putting it. Started 
proliferating all sorts of compounds and oh, yeah. testing them out. Incredible yeah. chemist, yeah, invented like 20 molecules, would test them on himself and his wife if they were interesting and share them with friends. Um, so Carl, young Carl, was really enamored with Shulgin and his work because Carl, um, he had tried LSD when he was like in eighth grade. He was all about it. Um, and Shulgin said, okay, you need to do a summer project. What do you want to do? And Carl was a big fan of MDA, as we were talking about earlier, and thought, okay, um, methamphetamine is more euphoric than plain amphetamine. The difference is this methyl group. Why don't I just stick the same methyl group onto MDA and see what happens. It's pretty logical. And, you know, Shulgin's like, that's a great idea. Let's do it. So they hold up in the summer of 1975, UC Berkeley, and synthesized MDMA together. And Shulgin took uh, most of it home, but he gave Carl a little baggie measured out just perfectly. I think it was like 125 milligrams, two doses. Um, and Carl and his girlfriend, Judith, wound up taking it um, on a beautiful September day on a boat ride across the San Francisco Bay to Sausalito. And, it's a yeah. beautiful recreation. You have him tell that story. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's really kind of magical. Um, there are moments where MDMA is, you know, it's sometimes it's that drug where it's like it's something you do by yourself or with, uh, you know, a loved one or somebody you want to connect with. On a, and when I say intimate, not necessarily sexual, but like a deep bond. Mm, yeah. Um, and then it becomes a kind of the ultimate rave. Well, actually, club drug first. Yeah. And then rave drug. What? How does? How does it start shifting out from that? Right. Well, back up just a step um, before that. So Shulgin did try MDMA after Carl reported back with very positive experiences in 76, and he realized this molecule's potential for therapy. Yeah. He introduced it to a therapist friend of his who became sort of this, I guess people say the Johnny Appleseed of MDMA in the therapeutic community. So mm -hmm. it quietly started spreading among um, first Bay Area therapists and then broader around the US and even internationally. But people were keeping really quiet about it because a lot of these therapists had either worked with LSD in the preceding decades or knew exactly what had happened with LSD being criminalized. So they knew that if word got out about this new psychoactive drug, it would absolutely be criminalized, just like LSD. And they right. didn't want that to happen because they were seeing such powerful yep. results. How, how did they use it in a therapeutic context? Yep. So there's some early studies um, from the Greers out of New Mexico. And, um, you know, at first, it's kind of funny, they were following the LSD model, but at first they were kind of just experimenting themselves with what worked, what didn't work. And um, in those original trials, they would actually take MDMA with their clients, wow. but they realized, okay, we need to not be high on MDMA because we need to focus on yeah. you and not make this about us. So that stopped. Um, but they would bring people kind of like the trials today, um, bring people to their house, give them a low or whatever dose they thought would be appropriate, and just let them work through whatever issue they were trying to work through. And the through. idea is, I mean, it, it opens people up. It allows them to, you know, be in touch with their feelings and feel connected. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of, well, Shulgin used the word window. So mm -hmm. it opens this window on yourself where you can find answers um, to questions you're asking your own self or partners um, without mm -hmm. fear, without anxiety, without the typical neuroses or mm -hmm. clutter of our brain that gets yeah. in the way. Um, so yeah, people used it for all kinds of things from couples counseling to just, uh, you know, I'm having this trouble at work. I want to work through that. I want to know myself deeper um, to more uh, serious things like trauma. Yeah. So that was all going on through the 70s. Um, but as you said earlier, MDMA did make this jump from the therapist couch to the dance floor. And um the Greer said to me in one point in the interview, you know, it was inevitable that this was going to happen. It's a drug that makes you feel good. People want to take drugs that make you feel good. Um, and there was a lot of tension between the recreational mm -hmm. and the therapeutic community, just as there was with LSD years before. You know, some people... And I guess we should point out that LSD, particularly during the 50s and early 60s, to some degree, was being used widely by therapists to Absol help, yeah. you know, yeah, just exactly. to help treat things like alcoholism, but just to get through things. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday, uh, while we're taping this, yesterday was Cary Grant's birthday, and Cary Grant is probably the best known kind of celebrity who took LSD and publicly extolled its virtues, uh, you know, saying like it made him feel alive again, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So MDMA is kind of 
an echo of that. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it was really the LSD therapist that paved the way for MDMA to then just slot right into that yeah. I guess, empty hole that had been left by LSD being criminalized. And the thing is, at this time, MDMA is completely legal. The government isn't aware of it. Um, so there's these the therapeutic community and many of them wanted to keep it a secret and, you know, only a thing that, you know, a, you know, friends tell friends. You can't like just spread it around a club. But there's also uh, a different contingent of people who wanted to just release it on the world and also make a nice profit right. in doing so. Also similar to LSD, really. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so the the sort of figurehead of the recreational scene at this time was a guy named Michael Clegg. Um, he ran a group that came to be known as the Texas Group because a lot of them were operating out of Dallas. And um, Michael Clegg just wanted to you know, churn out as much MDMA as possible, as quickly as possible, making a lot of money. Um, but he wasn't the typical, you know, drug lord that you think of, like, you know, I'm just going to like get everyone hooked and make their money. He he had these ideas of himself as um, enlightened, wanting to like serve a bigger purpose in the world, wanting to like help people be saved, you know, whatever that means to them. Um, so that was Michael Clegg. He uh, really spread MDMA across Texas, California, the U.S., and that is what attracted the attention of the U.S. government. Right. So then what happened? Yeah, then what happened? Um, well, the DEA moved to schedule MDMA. They, in summer of 85, which is when I was born, coincidentally, um, MDMA was put on the emergency schedule one list, and that meant that it was illegal. Um, well, the DEA, what they did not see coming, they thought this would just be a normal scheduling, is that there were all these therapists, mm -hmm. um, professors like at Harvard who believed in MDMA and thought it was worthy of study and worthy of use. So this group of therapists, including Sasha Shulgin, put together a case to bring the DEA to court and say, hey, this is a drug with medical right. purpose. So it can't be Schedule 1 because, you know, Schedule 1 is defined as no medical potential or right. no medical purpose. Right. Um, it should be Schedule 3. Allow us to work with it. Allow us to study it, you know, control it. But, you know, come on. Uh, and the really fascinating thing is they actually won that trial. The um, administrative law judge sided with them and said, yeah, you guys have shown that MDMA does indeed have value as a medicinal tool. It's being used by therapists. It should be Schedule 3. Um, but because of like whatever bureaucracy, I don't understand the like federal system, um, MDMA uh, was put on Schedule 1 because that judge's uh, determination was only a suggestion. So the DEA just did what they wanted to do the whole time. Yeah. Um, I am old enough to have taken MDMA before it was illegal and after. And one of the things oh, wow. I, I, feel I, have a, I have a strong memory of it being before uh, in the in the earlier eighties, it was more of a kind of reflective, introspective oh, drug. Interesting. And then after it became illegal, and you know, part of the concerns about it were like it was dangerously antisocial. Like you didn't want to go out or talk to people because mm. you were doing your own thing. Oh, that's fascinating. And then fascinating. post uh, post prohibition, it was like it's the biggest thing that was the problem about it is that it made you dangerously social, where you would go out and dance all night and kill yourself like you would mm -hmm, you couldn't stop mm -hmm. and you were part of a hive mind etc which is just kind of bizarre but so uh talk about maps uh mm -hmm. the the nonprofit that is the the group that is bringing M, you know has been working since the 80s to bring uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD and related indications how did they get involved and what role did they play in this world where MDMA has been banned. Right. Um, so I'll say that we would not be where we are today in terms of MDMA-assisted therapy being on the cusp of potential federal approval if it were not yeah. for MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Right. MAPS was founded in 1986 by a guy named Rick Doblin. Um, Rick was this kid who grew up outside Chicago, raised on, you know, stories around the family dinner table of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So Rick was this kid who was afraid that at any moment, all the people around him could just break out into yeah. like a maniacal genocide mode. And Rick really made it his mission in life. He's a strange kid, apparently, to yeah. find a kind solution for that. Kind of a strange adult, that. too. Yeah, just a strange guy. Yeah. yeah, it's a very interesting, unique yeah. character. Um, Rick 
uh, wound up at New College in Florida where he was introduced to drugs and he thought that doing, you know, mind melting doses of LSD, et cetera, was mm -hmm. the way to enlightenment. He did not find the answers um, that route, but through uh, those connections, he found his way to MDMA. And at first he thought it was like, oh, you know, how profound could this drug be if you can still talk on it? Um, but he quickly realized for himself the utility of just being able to communicate with people in the open way we were talking about right. earlier. And he thought, huh, maybe this drug is the answer for getting people to set aside their differences and seeing that we're all just human. We all want love. We all want the same right. thing. We have more in common than we have different. Um, Rick got involved in that DEA trial. He was one of the three um, younger people that was sort of spearheading the organizational effort, you know, getting the money, getting the lawyer, getting everyone to write letters. Um, after the trial, everyone gave up. Most people stopped use, uh, using MDMA in their practice because they didn't want to lose their license. Uh, Rick was the one person who did not give up and everybody thought like, you're an idiot. Like you're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. It's just a matter of time until you too, you know, see the writing on the wall. This is not coming back. Um, but Rick just is like very hard headed, I guess, yeah. like yeah. the most tenacious person ever. Um, and there was something that Rick actually learned at the trial. He was talking with one of the DEA agents who was representing the government. And this guy, Frank Sapienza, told Rick, look, kid like there might be something to this mdma thing but you are never going to get anywhere with it unless you go through the federal route right. you need to get approval you need to do fda trials um clinical trials like that's the way you got to do it and rick really took that to heart so he founded maps to see that through and you know it's taken like 38 yeah. plus years but like right. you know bless his heart yeah. and like, so part of his one of the lessons he talks about learning from kind of the LSD experience or, or the the way the war on drugs started playing out when, you know, I, I mean, it had been around before, but when Nixon announced it in the early 70s, it's like that outlaw route's not going to do it. We're going to try and go exactly. through official channels. Um, and where are they now? Do you, uh, like, you yeah. know, for FDA approval of uh, uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, you know, what what's the status of that? Yep. So um, clinical trials, you have to have three phases. Right. Phase one is the first just to show like, okay, this isn't going to kill like a bunch of rats and people. Phase two is kind of more efficacy and safety. And then phase three is the more rigorous like, okay, does this work and is it safe? Um, they have just completed the end of the phase three section. And again, this has taken like literally 20 plus years, yeah. um, you know, just in terms of paying for these things. So we'll get to this in a second, but Rick was just doing this all on fundraising, you know, and it costs millions literally to do clinical trials. Um, and also just jumping through all the paperwork and permissions hoops of the government. Um, so the second or the last phase three trials done and MAPS um, Public Benefit Corporation, which has now become a pharmaceutical company, just submitted a application to the um, FDA at the end of December asking for a new drug approval for mdma assisted therapy for PTSD. So the FDA has like a certain amount of time to respond, but long story short, um, hopefully there'll be some sort of answer bef by like mid-2024. That's the right. year we're in now, yes. Um, parallel to that kind of maps trying to get um, MDMA in certain circumstances approved, what happened you know, in the 80s and 90s and, two, mm. uh, and aughts with MDMA because right. it, you know, Timothy Leary once famously talked about how LSD escaped, you know, the CIA labs, you know, et cetera, and went into the mainstream. MDMA certainly escaped any kind of, you know, lockdown on it. Um, what was going on there? Yeah, um, a lot was going on. So in the late 80s, MDMA made its way to the UK which basically created raves because people wanted to keep partying after clubs closed and uh, yeah, hence raves. And raves in turn led to the multi-billion dollar electronic dance music industry that we have today. Um, MDMA through that rave pathway became a global phenomenon. So like tons of people doing MDMA, mostly youngsters, um, warehouses, clubs, potentially dangerous environments. And we started to see our first MDMA deaths um, you know, nothing like the number of alcohol deaths we right, see or other course. drugs, but, you know, a few deaths that would be overly covered in the news. And uh, and this is from people 
you kind of taking too much and having cardiac events or dehydrating and kind of dance. I mean, they were like, whirl, they would be talked about as whirling dervishes, right? They <laughs> exactly. would dance themselves to death. Like, yeah. So. I mean, hyperthermia was the main yeah. one, overheating, yeah. just, you know, getting too hot and like, yeah, overheating. Um, so MDMA became this like hysterical news study uh, or news story, you know, ecstasy is killing our children. It was seen as this threat to uh, sort of puritanical American and likewise British values. Right. Um, so there were tons of just really um, severe laws that came down banning Joe MDMA. Biden oh, yeah, was the involved Rave Act. in a, yes. the Rave yeah. Act, right? Trying yeah. to criminalize pacifiers and glow sticks as drug paraphernalia, yeah. for example. Um, but what that did is it really tarnished MDMA's reputation, almost in the same way as LSD's reputation was tarnished by being attached to the counterculture. Right. You know, it was a like a you know political strategy to try to take this drug down. And um, at the same time, the U.S. government, especially, was pumping money into studies to prove that MDMA was neurotoxic, that it harmed, that it impacted the brain in a detrimental way. Millions of dollars of federal funding went into labs, you know, tr little, literally trying to prove this. Um, and in the end, they didn't prove it because MDMA really isn't neurotoxic. It, it of course, can be dangerous if you take too much. But right. the lasting effect of that from the late 80s and through the 90s and even early aughts was that MDMA's reputation was really tainted. Um, any public understanding or awareness of its therapeutic value was completely paved over by this negative connotation. And, you know, it's that kind of connotation that I grew up with in right. the 80s. But then, you know, it it's kind of flipped, right? Because, I mean, there was that story, but then people were like, you know what, I actually, I feel really good on this, or I've had good experiences. Um, when did things seem to start tipping away? Because I would say now ecstasy is... Um, you know, it it doesn't have those negative connotations that it might have had at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, I can tell you my personal experience of when it flipped. Yeah. Um, so I wrote this book proposal in the pandemic, like I told you, and my agent sent it out to a bunch of editors, and we got all no's. People were saying, Michael Pollan already wrote this book, because right. they just don't understand the difference between a mushroom and MDMA or whatever. Right, yeah. um, other people were saying, this this book looks too positive about MDMA or about ecstasy. Why isn't this about the negative effects of ecstasy? Yeah. Um, and others were saying there's just not enough there to say anything about ecstasy. This isn't a book project. Then the first MAPS phase three study came out. Mm -hmm. I wrote about it for the New York Times. Suddenly the conversation just shifted in this really um, significant way. Yeah. I started getting interest on the book proposal. Um, I really think that 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 trial kind of legitimized MDMA and put it out there in the broader public understanding mm -hmm. in a way that um, wasn't present before. Um, what are the what are the the benefits of the MAPS approach of going through FDA approval and showing this is a medicine and mm -hmm. it's you know it, it's like other types of drugs you might help to you know get over depression or anxiety or something like that. Those are the benefits. Are there costs to MDMA kind of being talked about, oh, well, it's it's a medicine and you go to a doctor and mm -hmm. you get prescribed it and things like that. I have heard people who, you know, are more part of the underground scene and they're afraid that, oh, you know, this is going to make MDMA less cool if it's, you know, suddenly this, this medicine or, oh, we're sterilizing the industry. But um, I'm just remembering a comment that Ben Sessa, who is a, um, a therapist or a psychiatrist in the UK and also works with MDMA and other um, drugs like this, He's like, you know, like I can put on my white coat and then I can go to a rave, you know, whatever. It doesn't make MDMA less cool, but this is what we have to do to legitimize it, to like eventually move toward yeah. hopefully legality, not just for therapeutic uses, but also right. for recreational uses or whatever people want to do. And, you know, that's going to make these things safer in the end because then we're going to know where we're getting our drugs. We're going to know how to take them. We're going to have education about how to use them properly. This is almost always the case with what the government calls illicit drugs, not even illegal. They're immoral, <laughs> uh, you know, not knowing what's in them, which yep. is hard to do in black markets because dealers don't spend a lot of time putting labels on stuff Indeed. Um, or checking the providence. But um, a lot of the times the impurities in a drug are more terrible than whatever the thing is, including things like heroin and whatnot. What is the, um, you know, what's what's the role of the rave culture in kind of 
popularizing or kind of create not I don't want to say creating a market for ecstasy, mm-hmm. but like how does that work? Like what are the cultural manifestations that made people start to say not just like, oh, I'm gonna stay away from ecstasy, but actually that seems pretty interesting. I wanna do it. Yeah, or I mean try it. I think hearing your friends or people you trust say, hey, I tried this thing and not only was it like the like most fun night I've ever had. It also yeah. was like a profoundly beautiful experience. Yeah. That's actually how I found my way to this drug. Um, my now husband was a 90s raver kid mm-hmm. in Colorado going out to warehouses. Mm-hmm. And you know, when I met him, I still had these negative connotations about ecstasy. And then hearing his stories, and he was by no means trying to push me into this. He was yeah. done with MDMA. Um, I was finally just like, I wanna try this too. <laughs> like that yeah. sounds really fun. Um, you know. And I think that we really uh, look over or um, we don't give the rave scene its due credit. You know, millions and millions of people around the world have tried MDMA. Mill- uh, millions of them have had profound, beautiful, wonderful experiences on it. Yet there's very little rigorous attention paid to them, you know, from the scientific community. There's just not funding or interest to study them um, because the government is providing the mo- most of the, stu- the funding. And, you know, people aren't dying en masse like they are with right. meth or some other drug. Yeah. So I think there's just so many interesting questions to be mined there and, you know, stories to be heard. And then you have like kind of underground movements that come overground. So, you know, Burning Man is not certainly exclusively about MDMA, but that's mm-hmm. part of the culture and the rave element of that or the Electric Daisy Carnival. I mean, these are festivals where being part of the the throb, right? Yeah, is, exactly. Yeah, is, is, and you, you know, as you point out in your subtitle, that question of looking for connection, mm-hmm. um, how is there a quick explanation of how MDMA does that? Because most people would agree that it's like, if you're in the right set and setting and you take MDMA, like you have this sense, you know, people talk about an oceanic sense of unity and yeah. whatnot. And it's, it is beautiful. It's very deep and moving. Definitely. I mean, I think it really serves the purpose of, you know, these gatherings in the past that we could rely on from religion or, you know, mystical gatherings or whatever that we're really missing uh, today. And people are seeking that out. I mean, I know that's why I like to go to raves. Yeah. In terms of what it's actually doing, I mean, you know, massive dumps of serotonin, it not only um, blocks your receptors in your brain from taking up serotonin, which is this sort of jack of all trades, neurotransmitter, um, does all kinds of things, but um, your neurons actually dump out their stores of serotonin. uh, Something like 80% of your serotonin floods your brain on a night of MDMA or a day. Um, Oxytocin gets triggered as well. So there's just this whole um, chemical formula that's going on in your brain to produce that feeling. Yeah. Um, how, uh, how do different generations view or use MDMA differently? And I'm thinking, you know, there's somebody who we interviewed, uh, years ago who I know, Charlie Winninger, and I know, you know, him in a, uh, you know, a, 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 a therapist, a psychotherapist in his seventies who wrote a book called Listening to Ecstasy, Echoing Listening to Prozac. Um, you know, do people like that use MDMA in a different way than, you know, people your age or, or Gen Z? Mm, great question. I honestly, I think it more just comes down to an individual preference. So I, I was going to bring up Charlie. You beat me to it. Um, you know, Charlie and his uh, community oftentimes use MDMA in a way to, they dance, they have a great time, but they also connect on this um you know, with spoken word, they share their traumas, they, um, they find group healing through talking. I tried that and I cannot talk. Like, I just want to dance. Um, yeah. That's just me. But I know people my age or younger who also, you know, prefer to be at home and just like chat and yeah. put on some nice music. So I really think it just, it's who you are and it might be, you know, what you're in the mood for. How do you think uh, MDMA specifically fits into the larger kind of resurgence of psychedelics? Yeah. Well, I do think that MDMA is paving the way through this potential um, FDA approval. I think all things look good for MDMA to be the first psychedelic over that finish line. So, you know, that is absolutely major. Um, You know, I think MDMA in a way, it hasn't held things back, but, you know, returning to that stigma and that taint we talked about in the 90s and 2000s, 
And I think that was a really big obstacle to overcome mm -hmm. um, in a way that mushrooms didn't have to overcome because they just didn't have that same right. like negative connotation yeah. that MDMA or LSD had. I mean, you never hear anything about LSD, hardly at all. Um, MDMA, you know, I hear less about than I hear mushrooms. Like I was reading yeah. UC Berkeley's newsletter today, The Microdose, and it's like, oh, Indiana's moving to, um, you know, invest dollars in psilocybin research on PTSD right. and this and that. But you don't, the states aren't as eager to do MDMA, which, you know, I think it is the connotations, the stigma from earlier decades and um, also referring back to that synthetic issue yeah. that you mentioned. You know, for some reason, people are more comfortable with, uh, you know, a natural substance than right. one that was yeah, made in a Yeah, legalizing nature, meaning, I mean, there's a lot of movements to just say mm -hmm. plant-based ethnogens or, or certain types of psychedelics. I Maybe it's they're harder to regulate because they could grow anywhere. Yeah. But yeah, we have this I, I think it's an artificial distinction between na 100%. nature and artifice. But. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Um, but at the same time, I think MDMA is just such a useful and powerful tool for therapy just because it's yeah. um, it's such an, an easier medicine to work with right. or, or substance, I guess. It is, I mean, it's like, I, I would assume I've never actually done it in a, a strictly therapeutic setting, but it's... I don't know. It's like having Novocaine before a filling or something like it. Just <laughs> it primes you to to do the have the work done, right? That's perfect. Yeah, exactly. It's just this catalyst to make everything work better. Why, um, in the the kind of broad psychedelic space, and you know, some people will be pedantic and say, "Well, MDMA is not quite, you know, is not really a psychedelic, etc." But there's seems to be an appreciation for a bunch of substances, which realistically very few people use. Uh, you know, the number of people who report using, you know, LSD or MDMA or mushrooms in the past year are, I mean, in the very low single digits of people over the age of 18. Um, why are we, why does there seem to be so much interest in this? I mean, it's definitely changing these things. The laws seem to be changing. And there's a cultural moment where a lot of serious people are talking about this, a lot of creative people are talking about this, cultural app, you know, kind of artifacts of this stuff are coming out all over the place. What's going on? Definitely, I think it's a complex mix. So I think people are just fed up with the war on drugs. They're beginning to realize like just how idiotic it was, that mm -hmm. there's no way to you know, win this war, just what a waste of money yeah. and lives and you know, environment, you know, the list goes yeah. on. Uh, I think people also have come to realize that the quick chemical fix that we were hoping would come through um, psychiatric drugs mm -hmm. isn't working. You know, there's more and more people suffering from things like depression, anxiety, trauma. You know, the list goes on. So we're looking for other answers. Um, and then, a little bit more cynically, I think people like the idea of this like magic wand cure all, and they're mm -hmm. just like, oh gosh, you know, psychedelics are going to like. They're going to do all my problems. Yeah, they're going to yeah. do what Prozac failed to do. Exactly, right? yeah. and people want you know to believe in these magic cures, and you know it's not going to be that for most people. So. Do you you know a parallel with maps? They're a bit behind it, but uh, Compass Pathways, a pharmaceutical company, has gotten uh, they're pushing psilocybin uh, trials for depression and anxiety uh, with the FDA. Um, is there is that a good sign or a bad sign that you know? Uh, uh, you know, that big pharmaceutical companies are kind of starting to circle around this and be like, okay, there's a real opportunity here. Yeah. I mean, I think unfortunately it was just inevitable. Um, you know, if it's great that they're pushing trials through to get these medications mm -hmm. to people, um, you know, the monetization of it isn't great, but it's just, this is the system we live in. And I don't think that psychedelics were ever going to be able to reform the system. You know, Rick Doblin was hoping that he could get MDMA over the finish line with uh, charity alone. And right. I mean, incredibly, he raised 140 million plus dollars on donations. Um, yeah. And then he even says himself that uh, he was sort of a, um, a victim of his own success because by uh, helping bring the psychedelic renaissance about through MAPS, suddenly we have these companies like Compass Pump mm -hmm. popping up that are for profit. And then donors are like, well, why would I give you free money that I'm not going to see a return on right. when I can make an investment over here. Um, so MAPS isn't going to make it over the finish line with MDMA um, as a um, philanthropy funded product. Mm -hmm. They just spun out a pharmaceutical arm that is for profit. Right. They have a board, they have investors, you know, they tried really hard not to, but 
This is just the system that we live in. It's also fascinating because, and I know MAPS is doing this by tying it with therapy, but most of these substances, and I guess this is true of some pharmaceuticals, not all, but like the actual pills, you know, cost pennies to make. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it's hard to actually kind of monetize it. And that's, you know, there's ketamine therapy, which is kind of related to this, where the ketamine is is effectively zero dollars. And then the other stuff is where the money is going to be. And that presents challenges for the existing structure because pharmaceutical companies make money selling pills, not selling pills attached to exactly. a six-week therapy session or something like that. Yeah. Do you what do you, do you see any um, uh, big obstacles in you know the next couple of years to the um, medicalization and or legalization of these substances? I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some kind of bureaucratic whatever. I mean, there's a lot of positive si um, signs from the federal government that they're into this. You know, Biden released some memo about it. There's um, language in a new bill about veterans for investigating this. Um, but, you know, I just, the, the government is very, very conservative. So I can see right. there being all kinds of like hitches that, you know, delay this like years. But I think we not. need to, full, to bring it all full circle and who knows who's going to be president next year. But if, you know, it's Nixon who started the current war on drugs, went to China as a, you know, an anti-communist, Biden as the drug warrior, he's he needs to go to the Electric Daisy Carnival, right? And end it. I endorse or this. Something. Yeah, okay. That would be, Everyone, you heard it here. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we're going to stop there. The book is I Feel Love. Uh, the author is Rachel Newer. Thanks for talking. Thanks so much for having me. It was delightful. Mm -hmm.